Well, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever we happen to find you in the world for this um, special broadcast uh, from the Asia Society in New York, uh, where we are going to deal with um, the most recent developments in the Middle East. What's happening in Israel, uh, what's happening in Iran, uh, what's happening in uh, Afghanistan, and of course, um, Iraq uh, and uh, Syria, and across the wider region. And uh, to do this, uh, we brought together an extraordinary panel. We brought together uh, Dr. Megan O'Sullivan, the former Deputy National Security Advisor under the administration of President uh, George W. Bush, and she was the Special Advisor on Iraq and Afghanistan. We have Ambassador Dennis Ross, former US point man for the Middle East peace process. And we have Karim uh, Sajadpour, senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And of course, himself an Asia 21 alumnus. And of, uh, Karim is a particular expert on Iran. And so this uh, should be a good conversation, a good gathering. Uh, for our purposes uh, in this um, uh, broadcast, uh, we will have an open conversation with our three panellists, uh, which will take us through till about 10 minutes before the hour. If you have questions as a member of the viewing audience, please submit those uh, through uh, the chat box function, um, and they will then come to me and I will ask those questions of our panellists, and we'll conclude right on an hour after we begin, which is quarter after the hour. Um, I'm Kevin Rudd, I'm President of the Asia Society, and right now I'm in Brisbane in Australia. And for a little boast, we were just awarded the status of becoming the host country for the 2032 Olympics. Uh, hopefully, we're through COVID by then. So let's uh, let's um, uh, hit the ground uh, running and uh, pose our first set of questions. Um, <clears throat> I think I've got um, Ambassador Dennis Ross with me. Uh, Dennis, can I ask you this question? Um, we've seen, of course, this uh, extraordinary development in Israel, the change in the government. Uh, we now, of course, uh, have a new prime minister under Prime Minister Bennett. Um, could you give us a sense of uh, how this will change Israeli politics? How durable is his eight-party coalition? What's its new political centre of gravity? And how is this going to impact Israel's external relationships and what change will there be from the past? Over to you, Dennis. Okay. Well, thank, look, thanks, Kevin. Let me try to get my arms around uh, that array of questions. You, you said correctly, this is a, an eight-party government, absolutely unprecedented from a variety of standpoints. There are two right-wing parties. Uh, Prime Minister Bennett comes from one called Yamina. But there's another one called New Hope. Uh, so there's two right-wing parties. There is what I would call a right-of-center party, which is Israel Batenu, which is uh, Abigail Lieberman's party. There are two centrist parties, uh, Yair Lapid's party. Uh, he is the foreign minister now. And Blue White, uh, and Benny Gantz is the defense minister. And then there are two left-wing parties, or at least left-of-center and left-wing parties. One is the Labor Party, uh, headed by Marab Mikhaeli. Uh, and, and the last one uh, is uh, of Merits, which, is, which has always been seen as a, not just a left-wing party, but a, a peace party in Israel, pretty much always limited in terms of being on the left side of the spectrum. An interesting party in the sense that it is, it has uh, both a, Israeli Jewish and Israeli Arabs who are part of it. Now that also leads to one last party, the Ram Party, which is the Islamic movement in Israel. Uh, Mansour Abbas is the head of it. Uh, and it is for the first time we've actually seen an Arab party that is part of the coalition. It's not for the first time that we've seen an Arab party play a role in terms of sustaining a coalition. That was true during Rabin's time. But even then, you did not have an Arab party that was actually a part of the coalition had signed on to it. There were agreements that pertain to it. So this is, this is a true national unity government. It is a government with enormous ideological diversity. On its face, it might look like it couldn't be sustainable. And surely it will face a constant set of challenges and already has. But I think to understand why it may be more durable than most people think, 
you have to understand the role that former Prime Minister Netanyahu played both in terms of its formation and in terms of what I think is likely to be its a, a, an unexpected durability. What I mean by that is the following. There was this consensus across the board in Israel, left to right, that Prime Minister Netanyahu represented a challenge, a threat to Israel's basic institutions. Uh, and that's what produced this split on the right. That's what produced these two right-wing parties who decided to come together and join with parties that they never ever would have imagined they would have been part of a coalition with. Now, the reality that Prime Minister Netanyahu seems so determined to try to bring the government down, the reality that he is the, the leader of the opposition, uh, just as he created a glue that provided, in a sense, the, what, what brought them together, so long as he heads the opposition, so long as he seems so determined to try to constantly uh, plant landmines that will bring this government down, he again helps to preserve this coalition. He is the glue that preserves the coalition. Were he to no longer be the head of the opposition, not at all clear whether this government could survive. Now, having said that, the longer it does survive, the more it begins to take on a life of its own. And one of the things that's very striking about this coalition is that you have Prime Minister Bennett, uh, who I can only say sounds Biden-esque. Uh, he, <laughs> what he, his whole public demeanor is that it is time for us to treat each other not as enemies. When we have disagreements, we can discuss them. He's asked every party to basically respect the needs and the concerns of the other parties in the coalition. Uh, he said it's time for Israel uh, for Israelis to recognize the real threat to them comes from the kind of demonology that was being developed on the inside. Uh, so there's a kind of almost a sociological change uh, with this government. Uh, and, it, and I think it says it's, it's changing the character uh, of the political discourse. Now, not from the opposition. The opposition is constantly uh, presenting uh, positions or resolutions of, of no confidence. It is adopting positions that ran completely counter to positions it had when it was in the government. It was a, a citizen law that it championed when it was in the government and then was against it as soon as it was, as soon as the, the coalition was voting for it, the government was voting for it. So we're going to see what is, a, there still is a polarization with those who are uh, in opposition to the government, but the government itself spans the, the really, the whole spectrum of Israel. And I will say I was in Israel uh, during and after the handover. Uh, and it reminded me of, of what a lot of people in the United States felt uh, after President Trump. There was a sense of relief more than anything mm -hmm. else. And there was a sense that day-to-day -day politics wasn't characterized by a kind of colossal dysfunction and, uh, and a preoccupation with how you could demonize whoever you, who your, your opponents were. So we'll see. I mean, on the one hand, I'm suggesting that this may be more durable than people think just because the presence of Prime Minister Netanyahu, uh, the real measure is going to be, do they pass the government? Or do they pass the budget? By law, they have to do that. My guess is that if they succeed in doing that, and if I were to bet today, I would say, I think they will. If they succeed in doing that, they may well, that may well affect the opposition. Uh, it may take, I think we're looking at maybe five months before we'll see that. Prime Minister Netanyahu, former Prime Minister Netanyahu promised that this government would be brought down much more quickly than people think. If it turns out that it's not, that I think will produce challenges to him in the opposition. Now, just to run quickly through some of the, the issues that you were raising. What does it mean in terms of the relationship with the United States, uh, especially on an issue like Iran? What we've already seen is not that the, this, this, this new Israeli government is going to suddenly adopt a position that says, gee, we, we, we love the JCPOA. They're not going to do that. But the difference is they have also made it very clear differences with the United States will not be litigated in public. Uh, there will be quiet discussions. There already is a kind of instinct to, to adopt a position that says, you know, if the JCPOA comes back into being, that still means there's nine years uh, before the most important sunset provisions lapse. So we have nine years to be working with the United States to focus on how to deal with that. There is a, a 
a real belief that Prime Minister Netanyahu, when he was prime minister, made a fundamental strategic error in terms of not thinking about, okay, what's the alternative to the JCPOA? Hmm. Uh, and adopting this kind of public posture of opposition, going back to the speech that, that he made in the Congress, also produced something else that this new Israeli government is determined to try to deal with, which is the loss, or at least the imagery, as Israel lost its bipartisan standing in this country. Hmm. This is a government very determined to reach out to Democrats and to try to change uh, the image and understanding that for Israel, it needed to be an American interest, not a Republican or a Democratic interest. Uh, it doesn't mean there's any less concern about the Iranians, but it does mean there is a, a decision made that the, they will work quietly with the Biden administration. Uh, they will try to work through, they'll try to explain where they have concerns, see if there are ways to address them. Uh, and from what I've seen uh, so far, the Biden administration is actually quite appreciative uh, of, of this new government. Uh, they've just, uh, President Biden just hosted uh, the King of Jordan. One of the messages he came with is that there's, there's been a kind of uh, reconciliation with Israel uh, because of this new government. And he, he gave this new government with the president high marks. Uh, will this government be able to do a lot with the Palestinians? Not if one talks about trying to settle a conflict, but then again, the Palestinians are so divided at this point, there's very little that they could do. What this new government is, it's, it has a slogan, which is called shrinking the conflict, which is don't just try to manage the conflict, see how you can begin to reduce it. What can you do to change the conditions on the ground? Uh, this is one area where there's a consensus within the government. There isn't a consensus within the government as to what should be the final, you know, if you make a peace agreement with the Palestinians, what should its outlines look like? You're looking at the left wing of the party and even the center of the party that have views quite different from the right wing of the party, I mean, from the government. The right wing of the government you know, is not in favor of a state outcome, although never been quite clear to me exactly what they see as the alternative to that. But clearly the center and the left wing of the government are, in, are entirely in favor of a two-state outcome, but they all understand you can't produce it tomorrow. Uh, and so the question is, what can you do to reduce the nature of this conflict, change the, the character of it, uh, and make a resolution, whatever that might be, uh, more likely? But why don't I stop there? That gives you at least a, a flavor of who this government is and uh, how they might be dealing with some of the big issues. That's um, fascinating. Um, and um, I was taken in particular by your description of, um, of uh, the role played by former Prime Minister Netanyahu as providing the glue for this unlikely, um, shall we say, coalition of the willing uh, from the center left uh, to almost the far right. Um, I know you mentioned the important milestone of the passage of the budget. What's the, what's the temperament uh, within Netanyahu's own party to stay with him or to replace him? If you could briefly go to that one, and then I will, uh, of course, uh, go to Karim on the question of Iran. Again, there are kind of interesting parallels with the United States. The core of Likud, the backbone of the, the party publicly, I think is still strongly supportive uh, of the former prime minister. Those who are possible successors are increasingly uneasy. They resisted Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Netanyahu's desire have a, to have a very quick primary within Likud, because uh, they understood that he would win that. Uh, and so far, there's not, they're not moving towards a quick primary. There are rumblings, but no one's prepared to come out in public and, and challenge uh, former Prime Minister Netanyahu, although they're you have a couple of uh, Israel Katz, who was former finance minister, who made some comments that were as close to criticism as one might see coming out of the could right now. I think that there are a, a group of potential successors who are biding their time right now. Uh, I think they feel that it, it would be political folly for them to try to take him on at this point. But if it becomes clear that his promise that this government wouldn't survive and they'd be back in power very quickly, uh, when that doesn't materialize, assuming it doesn't materialize, uh, then I think we're going to see the challenges become much more overt. One other quick comment. 
the religious parties were always a part of the coalition that Netanyahu managed. Uh, and for them, they're outside the government right now. What matters most to them is monies for their yeshiva. Uh, the, as I said, Avigdor Lieberman as the finance minister has made it clear that he intends to cut the childcare allowances for those who don't work. That's targeted only on the religious parties. <laughs> Uh, those, you know, the, the men who study in yeshiva. Uh, and the longer it goes on, that in fact, they may be losing out on what matters most to them, the more we, we may see some defection from the religious parties. Right now, they'll hold out because they want to see if, if what Bibi said materializes. If it doesn't, their own practical interests may also produce some defections there. There's an old saying uh, one of the former leaders of the National Religious Parties once said, we promised to support the prime minister, but we didn't promise to follow the prime minister into the opposition. So we'll see. They're, they're there with him right now. We'll see if that's also durable. It's fascinating. It certainly makes um, American politics look simple by comparison. Um, Dennis. So uh, thanks for the uh, neat exposition. Karim, um, there have been elections uh, in Iran. Uh, we now have a new president, uh, uh, Ibrahim uh, Raisi. Uh, tell us um, about him. Uh, he's uh, reputed to be, quote, the hardliner. What does that actually mean in reality? Um, how, um, what's the shape now of uh, Iranian domestic politics? How stable is it? And what does his election mean for uh, Iran's external policy, its posture towards Israel, its posture towards the United States, and, of course, on the JCPOA? Over to you, my friend. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Kevin. It's great to be with you and Dennis and, and Megan. And in many ways, uh, uh, Iranian politics is, is kind of the opposite of what Dennis was describing about Israeli politics being this new rainbow coalition. Uh, the election of Raisi wasn't a rainbow and it's not a coalition. It's essentially one shade of black with kind of hardline conservatives really consolidating all branches of government. Um, Ibrahim Raisi is best known really as a hanging judge. That's how he got his start in the 1980s when the revolution happened. He was a young cleric and he was appointed to be uh, a judge. And, you know, he's implicated in the execution of, of thousands of, of political prisoners. And so that's kind of how he got his start. And over the last decade and a half, he's really risen to where he has now by being an acolyte of the Supreme Leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. So he's really kind of a mini-me for the Supreme Leader. And the widespread belief is that he's uh, the most likely individual to succeed Ayatollah Khamenei whenever Khamenei passes. Khamenei is now 82 years old. Mm -hmm. So I would say internally, we're not really going to witness a lot of change uh, within Iran. It's, it's likely going to become more repressive than it was. Um, and we're witnessing protests now in Khuzestan province uh, in Iran. I've seen some protests even in Tehran and in Tehran Metro. And I think those protests will, will, like in the past, be met with overwhelming repression. So we should expect internally more repression. Uh, externally, the longtime principles of the Islamic Republic are not going to change. So opposition to America, opposition to Israel's existence, the rivalry with Saudi Arabia, none of those things will change. But I do think external, they'll, they'll probably be even a bit more intransigent. And we're already kind of seeing signs of that in the nuclear negotiations with the United States. So uh, if, if you're the United States or you know, you're, you're um, the Europeans, um, Iran is going to be more difficult to engage. Um, but in some ways, it's going to be a little bit easier to isolate because there's no longer the the veneer of a moderate president in Iranian and and, and a moderate uh, Iranian foreign minister in, in Javad Zarif, and so um, my my expectation is that um, my, I, I do think, although I think, and, and I'd be curious to get Dennis and Megan's take on this. There's there's growing concern in Washington within the Biden administration that Iran may no longer be interested in returning to the nuclear deal. Um, my belief is that um, they really can't reverse their economic decline absent a removal of the sanctions. So I do think that they will eventually come back to the nuclear deal. 
Um, but the hopes of the Biden administration to expand on the nuclear deal to address you know, Iran's missile program, its drones, its regional ambitions, and, and, and prolong the nuclear agreement, um, I think that's going to be much more difficult. Your uh, description of a race as um, a Khamenei mini-me is uh, a striking one. Um, and I think you said various shades of black. <laughs> the, um, these are very stark analogies. Could you explain to our, our audience, how did this come about in terms of the Iranian election itself? Those of us who are casual observers of Iran, in which category I put myself, uh, I'm a China guy, um, and so I uh, follow uh, Iranian politics only as much as your average semi-intelligent reader. Um, but when we've looked at, for example, in the early Obama period of massive street protests, the dislocations occurring in the economy, uh, popular uh, discontent with the, uh, the nature and intensity of religious repression, uh, et cetera, how has this come about? There could be such a convincing win. And has the, shall we say, intensity of the American position against Iran during the Trump administration actually helped materially deliver this particular political outcome in the Iranian elections? Your reflections on that? Sure. So, um, you know, this really wasn't, Iranian elections have always had this kind of unique combination of being unfree, unfair, and unpredictable. And what was mm -hmm. unique about this election was it was not only unfree and unfair, but it was actually, it was actually predictable, meaning um, mm -hmm. because of the fact that Ayatollah Khamenei didn't want to take any chances on someone else being elected, they really limited the pool of candidates to Ibrahim Raisi and essentially six political dwarfs, people who had yeah. either zero popular appeal or people who were not known in the public. So they didn't want to, to take any chances. So, you know, that's why I always use the word selection rather than election. You know, Kevin, I think we've had this conversation before. The, the uh, analogy I sometimes make is that in the 1970s, both the Soviet Union and the Chin Chinese government really had a choice to make. They were kind of at this fork in the road and they had to decide, do we prioritize, do we double, do double down on our revolutionary ideology or do we go towards the path of our national and economic interests? Obviously the Chinese took the path of prioritizing the country's economic interests and they really transformed themselves. And the Soviet Union continued to double down on revolutionary ideology and we saw how that story ended. And I, I think the Islamic Republic whenever they've had that choice to make over the last 42 years, they've consistently doubled down on repression rather than reform. And I think this, you know, the, 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 the um, decision to um, essentially engineer the election of Ibrahim Raisi was Ayatollah Khamenei again making that, um, that, that choice. And in and, and Khamenei's worldview, it's, it's in fact, um, you know, similar to uh, the observations made uh, in centuries past by, by de Tocqueville and Machiavelli, that the most dangerous moment for any bad government is when it tries to reform itself. And so mm. I think for, for that reason, Khamenei has always felt, and this is the takeaway he learned from the collapse of the Soviet Union, that it happened when Gorbachev um, you know, pursued glasnost and perestroika, that actually hastened the demise of the system. So the, it, there's... The, 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 we call uh, people like Raisi and Khamenei, we, we refer to them, as, as you said earlier, as hardliners. And they refer to themselves as principalists because they say they're loyal to the principles of the 1979 revolution. And then among those principles are you know, the, the, the slogans of death to America and death to Israel. And so uh, in that respect, we, we, shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't expect any changes in, in Iran's uh, regional posture or its, uh, its outlook towards the United States? Well, um, <clears throat> disturbing indeed, but thank you for the analysis. Let me turn to Megan now. Um, Megan, when we look at um, uh, American policy and strategy towards uh, Afghanistan, uh, Iraq, uh, Syria, I know these are vastly different theatres, but uh, is it your view that the perception that the United States strategy under the Biden administration 
is driven by, shall we say, a desire to militarily withdraw um, and to diminish overall American uh, involvement in the region? Is it more complex than that? And perhaps you could also add to that your particular uh, observations, given your Afghanistan experience, of the practical impact of the US uh, troop withdrawal in Afghanistan, what will now happen with the Taliban and what will that mean for the stability of the country? Over to you, Megan. Great, thank you, Kevin. And it's uh, great to be here with you in the Asia Society. And um, it's always a privilege to be on any stage with Dennis and Kareem. So happy to be here. Um, there's a lot in, in that, that question. So let me try to uh, deal with it a little bit sequentially. First, the question about um, the perception of the Biden administration and being driven primarily by the desire to withdraw from the Middle East. I think the, the first place we need to start to understand that is just the reality um, that the Biden administration's priorities are uh, largely domestic. If you looked at the Biden administration or the Biden campaign per se, he had four major priorities for his time in office and that they were all domestic, largely domestic. Um, COVID, the economy, climate change and racial justice. The Middle East foreign policy, not really uh, in those top priorities. And even as we've heard about the, the rollout and the execution of American foreign policy, there's been a heavy domestic component to it. We hear talk of this evolving concept of a foreign policy for the middle class. And that clearly, you know, says we're trying to make sense of American foreign policy for um, the average American. So I think within this context, the question is, where does the Middle East fall? Um, if you look at some of the guidance that the administration has put out, there was a document or, called the Interim National Security Strategy mm -hmm. Guidance back in March. And in the Middle East, it was pretty explicit saying that the objective is to uh, right size, that was the phrase, right size um, the U.S. military commitment to the Middle East um, to be in line with counterterrorism objectives containing a Iran and then other national interests. So that last clause allows the, the policy potentially to be quite broad, but the message is pretty clear um, that the administration is, is looking to really shift focus away from the Middle East and towards Asia. And in many respects, I think this could sound or does sound a lot like the Obama administration, but I'd say it just six months in, there's some couple of, uh, a couple of really important distinctions from that. First is that the Biden administration is the first administration um, in a long time that is actually bringing down its military troop presence. And that's in Afghanistan. And I'll talk a, a little bit more about that in direct response to your question there. The second one is, um, and Kareem and Dennis will have thoughts on this as well, but I think the, um, the Obama administration, of course, uh, you know, Dennis and can talk to this more directly, but did have more of a potentially transformative view of its role in the Middle East. And that's vis-a-vis -vis its conversations and its uh, negotiations with Iran. Although, I think the administration, you know, saw the JCPOA, that's the um, the nuclear deal with Iran and um, the United States and other powers as, as being potentially transformative. That wasn't necessarily the rationale for it, but certainly there was the hope and even uh, some for, on the part of some, the expectation that integrating Iran into the international community and global economy would allow for a change in Iran's behavior throughout the region, which would qualitatively change um, the region itself and uh, the, the nature of the instability there. So I think the Biden administration um, has no pretense, has no uh, misinterpretation that any kind of an agreement with Iran could produce something that transformative. So even um, its more limited objectives in the Middle East, I think don't carry with them an expectations for transforming the region. So I do think um, that you know, it is appropriate to look at what the administration is doing somewhat in the context of you know, how to right size America's commitment there. And the real question is, will uh, the Biden administration be able to do that? And that brings me to Afghanistan. Um, I know your viewers will be well aware of what's happening in Afghanistan, that the Biden administration made a decision announced uh, a couple of months ago that it would complete the withdrawal that the Trump administration started and committed to um, and would complete it. Initially, they said by September 11th, I think people realized that that was uh, a really 
um, awkward at best and wildly inappropriate at worst uh, timeline to put it on. It's been changed to August 31st, but the reality is that most American troops are already out of Afghanistan. Um, and this has already led to, um, I think unraveling is not too dramatic a word to use, mm -hmm. The Taliban is now in control of 85% of the country. Uh, the Afghan forces, the Afghan military is proving to be extremely fragile uh, in some cases, handing over territory to the Taliban without firing a shot. And there's real concern in Kabul about the fragility of the government. And you've heard uh, senior government officials talk about this quite openly. Obviously, there's a lot of concern on the part of, of Afghan minorities and women and others, Americans and other people around the world who have supported um, the efforts in Afghanistan and the, the people who have really kind of courageously believed that they would be supported by the United States and others if they, um, you know, they, they followed in a, a project that, um, you know, uh, really uh, was based on the idea that that all um, elements of society could contribute to government society, the economy, um, with education and, and all kinds of other things. So there's a lot of concern about where this is headed. Let me say a couple of words, because I think this is interesting from the perspective of what this says about the Biden administration and how they're viewing the region at large, but how this decision came about. Um, in some respects, it's not a surprising decision. Anyone who knows President Biden knows that he um, has been interested in winding down the war in Afghanistan for a long time, um, actually stood against the, the Afghan surge that President Obama um, instituted back in that administration. And part of his campaign was calling for the end of the forever wars and ending the, the, um, the commitment, the military commitment in Afghanistan. However, what is surprising is how this happened and how abrupt it is. And I think it's fair to say um, how the administration has moved forward so quickly, even in the face of um, you know, not being able to answer some very, very key questions. Uh, for instance, how America's counterterrorism objectives are going to continue to be met in Afghanistan, even after the withdrawal. Um, essentially, to, to make a fairly long story short, this is uh, this put um, the president was faced with a difficult decision that former President Trump had put in place a policy, as I mentioned, that had already moved uh, moved the United States in the direction of a uh, withdrawal, and there were very few troops left on the ground. And President Biden was basically left with the decision of reversing that trajectory or continuing with it. And I think in the face of a couple of um, arguments, he made the decision he did. And one of the strongest arguments, um, the one that you hear the most, is that America needs to focus on Asia, needs to focus on China. There was also the argument that there was no peace agreement on the horizon, and that if the United States didn't withdraw this year, it would need to withdraw next year in the absence of a peace agreement or the year after. I think those, um, those uh, rationales uh, may prove to be pretty uh, tenuous over time. I mean, I think the first one is the most important one to examine is, does this withdrawal in fact allow America to focus more squarely on China and on Asia? And Kevin, you of course will have a lot to say about that and I'd be interested in that. My sense is this um, is not a very strong argument in the sense that the commitment that America had in Afghanistan had been dramatically reduced. We're talking about 3,500 troops um, that had not suffered a casualty for 18 months, that there wasn't necessarily this in incredible infusion of political effort or necessarily military support being given to Afghanistan. I think it's fair to say a little bit more would have been necessary to make it sustainable. But what we really needed was a change in the conversation away from is this about a peace agreement or not to a conversation about, in fact, is America willing to make a longer term commitment to Afghanistan, a small commitment, but a longer term one um, for the purpose of avoiding a bad outcome. Now, this, of course, is a very hard thing to sell. Um, to a population that is wary of war with Afghanistan. And I understand how reluctant the administration was to have that conversation. 
My fear is that Afghanistan is going to deteriorate to the point that it will once again involve uh, or demand the involvement of the Biden administration, and it could become a much bigger distraction from mm -hmm. the areas of the world war where America's uh, focus is really needed. I was on a congressionally mandated task force on Afghanistan to make recommendations to the new administration, and we heard very clearly um, intelligence and defense uh, uh, um, uh, assessments that if America were to withdraw, that the world should expect within 18 to 36 months that groups like Al Qaeda could uh, reconstitute themselves sufficiently to be a threat to um, the American homeland. So there, I hope this does not turn out to be the case, but there's certainly the possibility that Afghanistan will once again demand attention from America. Um, and perhaps uh, that attention will be more um, costly than it would have been to keep a, a small commitment. Um, I'll go very quickly to Iraq and Syria, but I realize that I've probably spoken for too long already and you're eager to get to some conversation. Just on Iraq and Syria, very different, as you mentioned, Kevin, very different cases. Um, just, I, I would say on Iraq, the, the country is, is um, having a, a crisis of sorts, but it actually is very different than the Afghan crisis. It's not um, the risk of the state collapsing from an external security threat like we saw under ISIS in 2014 to 2017. Um, this is more of a, a just a challenge of, of state building and nation building, that the biggest concerns in Iraq, I would say, are twofold. It's just the ability of the government to deliver services to Iraqis and a lot of discontent and frustration with the political system on the part of the average Iraqi. Um, and secondly, the um, role of Iranian-backed militias in Iraq. Iraq. These are militias that constituted during the fight against ISIS, have had a lot of Iranian influence, um, and now are uh, supported by the state of Iraq. Uh, Iraq actually devotes 2% of its GDP to sustaining these militias, which are not really in full control of the Iraqi government. And we've seen in the Biden administration three uses of a military force in the Middle East uh, in the last six months. They've all been in response to the activities of these Iranian-backed militias in Iraq. And I think um, the, those military strikes raise a number of questions that others might want to comment on, but I've just raised three very quickly. The first is, you know, to what extent is the, are these strikes actually providing the deterrence that they're intended to? They've been coupled with messages to the Iranian government. We're not trying to start a bigger confrontation between the United States and Iran, but we are trying to send you and others the clear message that these militias need to, their activities need to be reined in. They have, of course, been attacking uh, bases that house uh, American, American and other soldiers. The second um, implication, I would say, um, really has to do with the debate in the United States. The Democratic Party is starting to um, say to, or elements of, of the Democratic Party or Democratic lawmakers are starting to say to President Biden, you need to be seeking the um, um, the approval of Congress for these kinds of military uh, strikes, because this could lead to a bigger confrontation. And then finally, and Kareem, I'd be interested in Kareem's views, but I think it, it, these strikes, these military strikes and the back and forth with the Iranian militias really have some bearing on uh, the future of the talks between Iran and the United States and the United States' is, uh, partners. It really raises the question of, you know, it's potentially, it, it's my view would be that actually the fact that the Biden administration is willing to push back on Iran, even in the context of having these negotiations, should actually make it more feasible for the Biden administration to argue to Congress that they're not going to see a repeat of a deal on the nuclear file with Iran, meaning that the U.S. is not going to push back on problematic Iranian behavior elsewhere in the region. So I think that should be a positive message that should be helpful to Biden and if he is in the situation where he needs to sell an agreement with Iran. But of course, the opposite argument could be made. Um, let me just stop there in the interest of time. Well, oh, thanks, Megan. Um, in fairness to you, you've been asked to talk about three countries. And these guys only got to talk about one each. So that's, uh, uh, that's uh, perfectly understandable. I'm going to come back to you uh, in a minute in a question I've got from our viewing audience about uh, effectively, is the ANA, the Afghan National Army, that bad? But let's just come back uh, to that in a minute. Uh, first question I've got here from our audience is uh, to you, um, uh, Dennis, which is, uh, do you have a sense of when uh, we're going to have our first face-to-face -face meeting uh, 
between uh, President Biden and Prime Minister Bennett. Uh, when it does occur, what do you think will be um, uh, top on the agenda? What will be the top two or three items in terms of that meeting? Over to you, Dennis. And let's We'll do a, a series of short, sharp ones, if that's okay, a couple of minutes in response to each of these questions, and we'll bang through a few of them. Over to you, Dan Dennis. You're on mute, my friend. Uh, there is our, there is in the works right now um, arrangements being made to to schedule that first meeting. Uh, my guess is it may it may come sometime in late August. I think the main issues that will be on it will Iran will be front and center. Uh, first, because Prime Minister Bennett will want to be able to say that he raised it. Secondly, because this is an issue not just of mutual concern but as a desire, I think, to try to find what is an approach that reflects not what is already understood, which is we both share the objective of ensuring that Iran never has a nuclear weapon. I think one issue for the, for the Israelis is maybe that objective needs to be refined somewhat. Maybe that objective should be more in the category of Iran can't become a threshold nuclear weapon state. And how do we define what it means not to be a threshold nuclear weapon state, that could create much more of a common basis for the Israelis and the, and the uh, administration going forward. And I think the administration, I think, the, I think President Biden has just as much of an interest to try to reach that kind of an understanding with the Israelis uh, as well. Clearly there'll be discussion on what to do with the Palestinians. Uh, and here I think there's much more of a potential for a meeting of the minds than people might anticipate President Biden has very low expectations that you can achieve a two-state outcome anytime soon. He wants it clear that this is an objective of the United States. Uh, it's an important objective because he doesn't see an alternative to a two-state solution. But he also understands if you can't achieve it soon, what is it we should be doing that can change the conditions or the circumstances so what isn't possible today can become possible over time. Here, I think, again, there's a convergence between Prime Minister Bennett will come with this concept of shrinking the conflict. I think that will converge well with the administration's notion of what might be done. Where I think there needs to be more of a discussion between the two sides is, how do you build on the Abraham Accords? The administration is strongly supportive of the Abraham Accords, but you can't build on them unless you're prepared to actually broker some follow on to them. And I've made the argument, now I'm gonna switch into my own view, if you want to break this, the stalemate between Israelis and Palestinians, use the normalization process. To give you an exactly. example, if the Saudis were to do public outreach towards Israel, they would expect something from the Israelis, uh, they would require something from the Israelis towards the Palestinians. Uh, they would also require something from the U.S. towards Saudi Arabia. That requires some active brokering. I think Israel has very much of an interest in seeing that take place. And I would just say again, to put this in perspective, when the UAE uh, normalized with Israel, they said to the Israelis, the condition is no annexation of the territories provided for Israel in the Trump plan. That got 80% support within Israel. When the Israeli public was given the choice of normalization or annexation, 80% were for normalization. Now, typically, you can't get 80% of the, of the Israeli public to agree on whether it's day or night. So the fact <laughs> that 80% were prepared to accept normalization, not annexation, tells you there's a political space there, I think, including for this government, if the administration wants to pursue it. And I believe that there will be an interest on Bennett's part to ask questions about, okay, what's, what steps can be taken to build on the normalization process? That's, uh, that's fascinating, particularly as um, from an Israeli perspective, Saudi Arabia is kind of the jewel in the crown in terms of where the Abraham Accords go next. So there is, as you said, a very interesting creative play to be made there if there's um, enough live diplomacy between the three capitals. But Karim, can I ask a question which has been put to us also by our audience, which is uh, the wider geopolitics of uh, the new... Uh, government in Tehran under Prime Minister Raisi. Uh, will there be any changes in terms of Iranian policy and strategy towards Russia, towards China, um, uh, or will it simply be uh, 
a continuation of what we've seen in the past. Uh, and do the Chinese have a, um, uh, a more expansive strategy towards uh, Tehran uh, and their Iranian engagement in the future? Over to you, Karim. And let's, we'll keep these short and sharp, but that's okay. Sure. <clears throat> I, I, I do think that uh, this new Raisi administration is more likely to look to Russia and to, to, to China rather than to um, Europe and certainly the United States. And this is a concern, obviously, the Biden administration has because right now they've uh, allowed Iran to increase its oil exports to China. And there's a concern that Tehran has less of a sense of urgency to revive the nuclear deal if it can um, if it can export oil to China. In fact, you know, Kevin, I almost have a question here for you, which is, um, and I'm curious whether Dennis and Megan would agree that when you talk to um, governments and leaders in the Middle East, I, I would say what concerns them most uh, nowadays uh, about Iran and Iran's destabilizing role in the region is, is not necessarily Iran's nuclear program, but it's, uh, cultivation it's, it's in its dissemination of precision drones, missiles, and rockets. Um, and one of the um, things which is talked about is whether um, it would be possible to do a follow-on deal to the JCPOA, which addresses this issue, uh, uh, the precision rockets, missiles, and drones, and whether or not um, China could be uh, could, could play a, a constructive role in that, in that, um, you know, for when you talk to Chinese leaders, as you know, about the Middle East, what, what they will say is that their foremost priority is, is stability and, and harmony in order to ensure the free flow of oil. So we're in this kind of um, wild west when it comes to drones, missiles, and rockets. And I'm curious whether the same way that you know China, Russia, Europe, and the United States came together with the, um, with the lowest common denominator being wanting to prevent a nuclear armed Iran, is there a way for China, Europe, uh, Russia, and the United States to, to come together to to address um, you know this new world we're all living in, which is which is drone warfare. Um, not my place to um, uh, speak on this uh, illustrious panel, which knows the region infinitely better than I do. But from a Chinese perspective, I think you are uh, close to an accurate assessment that China wishes above all uh, to see stability within the region. Its longest and most established and comprehensive relationship, as you know, is with Iran. Um, when I was serving in our embassy in Beijing, I remember the Silk Road missile traffic between Beijing and, uh, and Tehran way back then in the 80s. Uh, things have changed since then. But how might this occur um, is given China's profound interest in expanding its relationship with Saudi and with the Emirates and with Bahrain, for a range of interests and not just hydrocarbons. Um, a request from the Gulf monarchies uh, for the Chinese to look at, as it were, a robust um, uh, pan-regional agreement uh, involving these other weapons categories uh, would be something that China would then have to consider very deeply. Uh, the leverage point will not be the Americans asking them, will not be the Europeans asking. The leverage point would be the, the Gulf monarchies in my view. So I think uh, that is the way in which, if I was providing free advice to um, uh, our friends in Abu Dhabi and, and Riyadh and elsewhere, would be uh, where to go. Question uh, for you, Megan, which uh, builds on what we were discussing before. Uh, your depiction of how things are unfolding in Afghanistan is particularly grim, uh, given that the American troop withdrawal is so recent. Question I have here from the audience is, is the ANA that bad? Um, and uh, if you were to roll out a projection, say for six months time, um, how safe and secure are the principal cities? Uh, not just of course, Kabul, but Kandahar and the others. Um, and, uh, and do you consider in this question the possibility that the Biden administration will be forced to U-turn and to recommit troops in order to restabilize the country? Over to you, Megan. Sure, um, and I'll try to be succinct here. Um, first on the 
ANA, the Afghan National Army, um, you know, the first thing I would say in fairness to all of those Afghans is that um, the, that institution has taken the absolute brunt of the casualties um, in the fight against the Taliban that the United States for and its coalition partners, because we have to keep in mind that while the United States had 3,500 troops um, in Afghanistan, there were, were about 8,000 of our allied partners um, with us that are also going to withdraw because their presence is unsustainable in Afghanistan without the US military there. So, but the point about the Afghan National Army is that I, that uh, force has really been at the forefront of the fight against the Taliban taking um, the losses. And the real question is how, um, how sustainable is that force without coalition support? So um, there was actually a testimony from the, the head of the command of the US Special Operations um, he gave uh, testimony back in March, I think, to Congress, and he basically said that the Afghan National Army is unsustainable without the U.S. Um, coalition behind it. And, and that is because uh, the coalition, not just the U.S., but the coalition as a whole, provides some really vital capabilities yeah. to the Afghan National Army or the Af Afghan National Security Forces. Um, and those have to do with medical evacuation, intelligence, uh, close air support being probably the most important of them. And all of those things will be very difficult to impossible um, to provide if the United States or when the United States and the coalition partners don't have any presence in the uh, in, in Afghanistan and a question about what kind of presence the US will have in the region as a whole. So in light of that assessment, I think then we have seen what we have seen over the last several, um, the last couple of months since the Biden administration made that announcement. So I think there's a heavy psychology element here. If I think back to um, how ISIS swept through Iraq and ended up taking control of a third of Iraq um, after the withdrawal of US troops in 2011, a lot of that was also Iraqi ar the ar Iraqi army laying down their, their weapons and um, just fleeing in the face of a much smaller force, but not having the confidence or the backbone um, to fight it. And that did result in the United States coming back into Iraq, as we know, in 2014, and is still there. But again, in a very modified capacity, not at all in large numbers and not at all at the forefront of fighting, but really providing support. So I think the key lesson here is that I think the Afghan National Army is very vulnerable um, to the question about what do things look like in six months? You don't need to rely on my personal assessment. There was an intelligence uh, report that was um, that became public just a few weeks ago that said um, that the Afghan government had a very real possibility of falling within six to 12 months after an American withdrawal. Um, that I think it was a very stark assessment, but certainly um, I think it's a very hard one to dismiss. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I wish I had more good news here. This is not a good news story at this point in time. And just lastly on the point, do is it possible that the Biden administration will need to uh, return to Afghanistan? This is a tough question um, because I think there is no intention to return to Afghanistan. Um, however, there was no intention to return to Iraq either. And the United States did end up doing that because it saw the takeover as ISIS as sufficiently challenging to US interests. And mm -hmm. certainly is the possibility that there will be the reconstitution of groups inside of Afghanistan that will, as I mentioned, pose a threat to the US homeland. And in that case, I think we would see some kind of re-engagement. Um, this is not necessarily a big military uh, invasion, but you know there could be more um, engagement, certainly more counterterrorism activity and support. Um, the assessment again of the defense and intelligence communities is that Al Qaeda and other groups in Afghanistan, they're, they've been really severely degraded in their capabilities, but the part of that assessment is because of the ongoing activities of the coalition, which again, won't be happening. Hmm. Very stark indeed. And um, as we know from what happened in Iraq, uh, U-turns are possible, um, politically difficult to execute, but sometimes strategically, militarily and um, politically um, uh, unavoidable. But also distracting from the big picture. You know, we remember how President Obama got pulled back into the Middle East to some extent when he really wanted to focus more on Asia. And, um, you know, hopefully we don't see a repeat of that um, in the Biden administration.
I always thought your great powers were good at walking and chewing gum at the same time. But anyway, that's just a, an observation from uh, the trenches. So uh, we'll come back to that. One more quick round of uh, questions each, and then we can uh, allow you all to go. Back to you, um, Ambassador Ross. Question I have, uh, again, from the audience is the attitude of uh, the Bennett government uh, to the historical uh, practice of previous uh, Israeli administrations on settlements policy. Um, will there be any change uh, to the um, uh, Israel's attitude to existing settlements, new settlements? Um, uh, uh, or is there a, um, a, an appetite for change or does that simply go to the, um, the difficulties of the internal cohesion of the eight-party coalition? Uh, Dennis, over to you quickly. I do think the, the the settlement issue is is one that uh, really could tear this government apart because the the right wing, Yamina and New Hope, this is very much a part of their credo. Uh, what Prime Minister Bennett has tried to say is that we have to respect the, the limits. We can't do all the things we would want to do. Those on the those who have different perspectives can't do what they want. I think the challenge here is going to be, can they come to some kind of accommodation uh, on settlement questions? It's very interesting that today in the Israeli press, uh, in, in Israel Hayom, which is a, a right-wing paper, there is, uh, they're accusing the government of having a settlement pause or freeze because they're not permitting the, the meeting of committees that would be making decisions on what to do. Uh, now, is that a conscious decision? Is it being done in light of Bennett coming to the States? Is it uh, a kind of compromise uh, for now? Hard to say at this point, but this is a, this thing, I think this is an issue that will be hard for the administration. I just wanna make one additional comment. When I talked about if there was a Saudi outreach to Israel, say the Saudis were to establish a a commercial office uh, in Tel Aviv, they might ask the Israelis to stop all building outside the settlement blocks. The blocks are those areas in about five or 6% of the West Bank closest to the Green Line uh, where the vast majority of settlers live. Uh, if, you were, if you stop building outside the blocks, basically you preserve the ability to separate from Palestinians. That might mm -hmm. be a really interesting proposition to see what this government would do, I think the vast majority of Israelis in the public would support such a trade-off. And I suspect in the end, this government would go along. Will that happen? I don't know. Thanks so much uh, for that, um, Dennis. That will galvanize um, much attention, as you know, in European and other capitals as well, as well as uh, among the, uh, the Gulf states. A final question for you, uh, Karim, goes again back to the China question, which has uh, been raised from the audience and goes to uh, now Iran's uh, dependency on China in terms of Iranian oil sales, uh, now the biggest market for Iranian oil. Uh, what vulnerabilities does this present for the Iranians? Uh, if the JCPOA negotiations break down, there is um, uh, no nuclear agreement whatsoever. Is it possible that, in fact, you could begin to see uh, even more acute American leverage uh, applied by force, this is the question I've been given, uh, to interrupt uh, Iranian oil sales uh, to China. Uh, back to you, Karim. Well, I think that it's right that Iran's economy uh, has become almost wholly reliant on, on China and oil exports to China. And I do think that the Biden administration is likely going to have to um, use coercion, whether that's um, you know, uh, additional sanctions or enforcing existing sanctions to curtail Iran's exports to China, China to give Tehran, as I said, this sense of urgency that uh, it's imperative to revive the nuclear deal. Um, you know, I, I actually think, however, that um, my, my belief is that the nuclear deal will likely be revived. And the debate I have with my friends on the right who fear that a revival of the nuclear deal is actually going to entrench the Iranian government is, is to actually look historically at, you know, when is it that popular tumult most often happens? And as you know, Kevin, it's, it's, we know from history that uh, 
Um, you know, popular tumult more often happens when people's quality of lives starting to improve and their expectations start to rise, but those expectations are then unfulfilled and, and they're disappointed. And that uh, more often triggers popular tumult. It's known as the J-curve theory or, or revolution of rising expectations. So um, I, I, I think that um, the Biden administration um, is, is likely going to have to, um, you know, frustrate and, and, and disrupt and curtail Iranian oil sales to China in order to get the nuclear deal revived. But as I said, even if the deal um, is revived, I don't think that's a get out of jail uh, free card for, for the Islamic Republic of Iran. I think they're just going to face a new set of challenges down the road. Yeah, it goes as directly to a question if the deal fails about the uh, capacity for the United States to enforce unilateral sanctions, particularly dealing with China, where China has made it plain in a number of other, shall we say, theatres that um, uh, UN Security Council sanctions, where China, of course, has a veto, yes, unilateral sanctions, uh, no way, Jose, uh, or the Chinese expression for that. Um, thank you for those comments. And let's just conclude, um, if I may, with a final question to Megan, staying with the energy question. Megan, if we stand back and look at the entire region, given the hydrocarbon intensity of the region and exports uh, from Iran, uh, from Iraq, uh, from uh, the Gulf monarchies, um, then, and we look at the same time as the, uh, the global transition uh, from uh, carbon to renewables over time, where does this leave the region um, uh, in the long term? And uh, what sort of planning is occurring uh, within the region in terms of uh, possibly a quite deep energy transformation? Is this a near-term challenge or are we really talking about mid-century here? And if you could uh, wrap up our conversation today in the next couple of minutes, uh, Megan, then I can let you all go. Over to you. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, energy transition in, in two minutes, um, the, it, which is fair. Um, I would say there are some misconceptions about the energy transition and how it will affect the Middle East. And this is important because I think it does influence um, how strategic people expect the region to be, not necessarily in the long run, um, but I would say beyond the near term, near to, to medium term. Let's talk about near to 2040. Um, that actually the energy tr transition will not necessarily be um, the create the enormous, well, it will create challenges for the region, but it's going to affect the region very differently. There are some countries that will be devastated by this. And these are countries that have weak institutions that have been unable to diversify their economies um, and have governments who um, are not able to try to um, pivot to a different kind of um, economic structure and have a high cost of producing oil, in which case that they're likely to be displaced by lower cost producers. However, there's a set of producers in the Middle East that tend to be politically, strategically significant as well as economically. And I would think about the Saudis, the Emiratis and, and, and others who may be very well positioned to weather this um, energy transition. If you look at all of the scenarios put out, um, even the most ambitious scenarios about what the world's economy is going to look like and what energy sources it's going to rely on in 2050, um, all of them have a certain amount of oil in it less oil than the world is consuming today, but a certain amount of oil whose um, carbon emissions will be captured or dealt with in a, in, in a different way. And uh, countries like Saudi Arabia and UAE plan on being those producers. They plan on being, and they have every reason to believe that as the lowest cost producers in the world, that they will be the ones meeting much diminished oil demand um, of the world. So therefore, I expect they'll be strategically more significant. There'll be a smaller pie of oil, but they will be producing more of that pie. So we can't write them off as being um, no longer strategically strategic when it comes to energy, not to mention all the other areas in which they may maintain strategic um, strategic significance. So the last 
thing I would just point to for people really interested in this, we saw over the last couple of weeks, uh, a lot of tension between the Saudis and the Emiratis, which in itself is not anything new, but what is new, it is around energy policy and it was around oil policy in the context of OPEC. And I think mm -hmm. we're going to see more of that as different countries have different strategies and different timelines for when they can shift their approach towards um, their oil production and um, what they can do in terms of managing the energy transition. So it's going to affect the politics within the region as well as the politics outside the region. Thank you so much, Megan. Uh, we at the Asia Society have been uh, genuinely blessed to have um, this extraordinary panel today. And thank you to Dr. Megan O'Sullivan, uh, who's given us um, sobering reflections for Afghanistan for the next six months. Um, and uh, what happens in the response to the question I posed, which is, could the United States be forced to U-turn? Um, uh, also to Kareem um, uh, Sajadpour uh, and his reflections on uh, the new uh, regime in Tehran uh, and the, the depth of the strategic relationship with China. Uh, and, uh, but still his view overall that it's in the regime's self-perceived uh, interest to probably arrive at a JCPOA outcome as the only means by which to get out of jail on the economy and some restoration of economic growth given the intensity of sanctions. And, uh, and thank you to Ambassador Dennis Ross for uh, the most lucid exposition I've heard of this eight party coalition uh, in Israel, which frankly, having read a number of newspaper and journal articles has left me bamboozled until today. So I thank you, Dennis, uh, for the de-bamboozlement which you provided for me and that really interesting proposition which you put before uh, in terms of that space which exists for the kingdom, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, uh, in a creative play involving the Americans and the Israelis on the Palestinian question. So to all three of you, thank you so much for being such good friends of the Asia Society and uh, for honouring me with your personal friendships as well. I really do value that. Um, so um, that's it from us. Um, and we look forward to you, our, our global audience, uh, to uh, continue to engage with us with our future programming at the Asia Society in the weeks and months ahead. We've got new events coming up on China, Japan, the Republic of Korea and elsewhere. But for today, it's the Middle East. And thank you to this expert panel.